Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. He often had nightmares. He wakes up in the night in a cold sweat. Something is troubling him. The boy gets out of bed, goes to the stairwell, looks around, there is no one. He walks down the stairs as usual. And when he gets outside, he sees that there's been an apocalypse. Everything's destroyed. The houses are piles of bricks. There's no one in the street. From the corner, someone looks out. And with some sixth sense, the boy realizes that it's not a person. He jumps out of his seat and runs back into the entrance. But now there are only stairs and no walls. The boy screams. And at that moment, he wakes up. Son, what's wrong? Mom's awake too. Yes. Just like that, just a scary dream, he was still sitting on the bed. Confused, it seemed that everything he had just seen was true. Come on, lie down, school tomorrow, the woman muttered. Okay, the boy agreed with her, even though he didn't really feel like doing it. He went back to bed, fell asleep, and the dream seemed to go on and on. It was scary, but he couldn't wake up. The next day John got up in the morning, wrung out like a lemon. He couldn't pull himself together, he really wanted to sleep. But the boy went to school anyway. He knew that if he didn't, his parents would be displeased. The family lived in an ordinary town. John had a sister, his own father had long gone. His mother lived with a new husband, who was a stepfather to the guy. Mom, are we going out with the boys a little longer tonight? Asked the son in the evening. What's wrong? The woman looked at him. Simple, he shrugged, not knowing what to say. Everything on the weekend, please, but during the week, you shouldn't was the woman's stern. All right, well, John didn't like these lectures. He went out to the courtyard, told his friends that nothing was going to happen today. They were going to one of the houses that was in their neighborhood. The young people there had a basement. Now, when they were already in the eighth grade, they could smoke and drink beer. But back then, you had to walk around a lot longer to get the air out. Then we'll sit here, Harry pointed to a bench in the yard. Great, no one argued with him, no need to go anywhere if everyone lived nearby. There was no ringleader or leader. Everyone was on equal footing. It was the 90s, so young people did what they could. On the weekend we'll go to a disco, Artem said. Of course it was a favorite thing. If we're lucky, guys from another neighborhood will come, we can fight, Harry said. Yeah, we'll have to be prepared. John remembered the last time the opponents had brass knuckles. All they could come up with was a weighted stone. Don't teach a scholar, his comrade told him. In those years, young people, what only did not come up with, there was practically no place to go. All the circles ended in the afternoon. And in the evening, the boys were left to themselves. They would get together, talk about a plan of action. They took money, bought cheap alcohol, drank it at construction sites or abandoned buildings. Hey, John. One day, an older friend came up to the guy. Hey, the guy looked at him. It was Evan. He graduated two years ago, and now he was looking for intrepid teenagers. Come on, let's go outside, we need to talk. He knew John wasn't timid and could do a lot. All right, John looked back at his friends and followed his older friend. Of course it was a little scary, because he knew what Evan was doing, but it would be embarrassing for him if he didn't go. The young men rounded the corner of the building and Evan looked around and handed John two matchboxes. What's this? He didn't understand. Don't you know? Even winked at him. I guess, John told him. Well, if you guess, you probably know what to do with it, the older man grinned. About. John quickly tucked what he had just been handed into his pocket. You hand it over, you'll get some good money, the piece of paper said who to hand it all to. Okay, the boy walked back towards the school, he didn't look back at even. At first it was very scary because John was afraid that someone would see or know what he was doing. But once, twice, three times, and then he felt at ease, because not only did he have money, and not bad money, but he was in circles with the older guys. Knew if somebody was hurting, you could just tell them and they'd stand up for him. John, are you coming or not? Harry called out to him, but he had to wait for the bell to ring and hand over what was in his pocket. Yes, wait a minute, the young man waved him off. Listen, tell me, why are you so different lately? A friend came up to him. Come on, I'll tell you everything later. Now is just not the time that I did not want to share information with anyone, because first of all, he was afraid that everything would come out. 
Over the weekend, they met up with Evan again. He handed him some matchboxes. This is more than you need, isn't it? John looked at him. I'll be gone for a while. So if they ask, you can sell, Evan told him. I hear you. They parted ways. John came home. There were two boxes in his pocket. They were straight up burning through his pants. The boy knew if his mother found these in his pants, nothing good would come of it. In the evening you went for a walk. He ran into Harry in the yard. Listen friend, I have something very important to tell you, John approached him. Talk, the friend was always ready to listen. Do you remember Ivan coming up to me at school? He asked him. Of course I remember, Harry smiled. So, and John started to tell him what and how they were going on. Well, what do you want from me? Harry stood there. He was in complete shock. He couldn't even guess that this kind of stuff was going on at school. Here, can you hide them in your house or something? He pulled the boxes out of his pocket. Wow, he opened one of them. Close it or you'll spill it. John looked around, afraid that someone might see them. Look, why don't we try it? Harry smiled. I don't even know. We'll have to invest later, the boy shrugged. All right, we'll invest. It's not that expensive, his friend told him. That afternoon a group of guys gathered in their camer. In theory they knew how to do everything, so nothing was complicated. John took a drag. He didn't feel anything wrong with it, it even seemed to him that it was like ordinary cigarettes. Afterward, when the boys went home, he felt a little dizzy, and to now whoever said whatever, it seemed ridiculous. The boy came home, saying something, giggling. The mother suspected something wrong, she started questioning her son, but he kept quiet, didn't say anything. Then, the next day, the woman called a policeman she knew and shared her suspicions with him. He offered to hold a preventive conversation on the topic that was of concern to all parents, but he also said that the mother did not warn anyone, let the son does not know, he will think that it is a stranger to no one. So it was agreed. In the evening, when John came home, they had a policeman sitting in the kitchen as a guest. Hello, he looked at him, but his knees were shaking. He was thinking now that he had done the right thing when he gave Harry the boxes. Come in, John, I'm waiting for you, the man told him. John made his way into the kitchen, sat down across from him. He didn't look up, he was really scared that now he was going to start talking and his mom and everyone else would find out what he was doing. So, young man, there was a signal from the school that you are doing the wrong things, and you need a preventive talk. So I came, said the man, you wrote something in a notebook. I didn't do anything like that, John started to mumble, but then he thought, the more you deny it, the more they'll think about you, he stopped talking. I'm not accusing you of anything yet, the uniformed man smirked. Why did you come then? The boy didn't understand. His mother stood beside him and saw that her son was not comfortable. I told you, this is a preventive conversation. Everyone knows that now there are a lot of illegal substances, they are distributed among school children and other residents of our city. I just want you to know that if you suddenly get into a company where they do it, or even worse, start using or distributing, nothing good is waiting for you in the future," the policeman said. I understand, John shook his head, he really understood that it was very dangerous, and if he kept doing it, someone would find out or he would get caught. Two days later when they met even, John had told him that, and no amount of money or persuasion could make him keep doing it. The boy wanted to finish nine grades and leave school. But in the past all parents were in favor of their child completing the full school course, that is, 11 grades, and then going to a good school. No, my dear, you will study all the years, you will get a certificate, and when you turn 18 then please, decide everything for yourself and do what you want," his mother told him. But why waste two years? John didn't understand. I think you'll waste them anyway if you even leave school, his mother worried about her son. Now that John had his own opinion, he often argued with his mother because their views were very different from each other. The young man became fascinated by computer technology. He was constantly collecting, disassembling, looking at how everything is organized, trying to do something new. When he was in his senior year of high school, he already understood that he could assemble and disassemble a computer, as well as make small repairs. So, maybe you will connect your life with these, his mother told him. I haven't decided yet, he answered her. Just, I see that you are good at it. She stood and watched her son at the table deftly going through the parts and putting one to another. Yeah, okay, I'll think about it, he promised his mother. He only had one friend left at school now, and that was Harry. Almost everyone from the yard had moved away gone to school. 
With Harry, they talked about the future, how and what would happen next. Now we'll finish school, they'll take us into the army, John said. And it's fine, we'll serve, come back, then start working, said Harry. So they decided. After that they began to think of something to do. There were a lot of ideas, but everything was wrong. One needed a lot of money to start, the other also needed equipment to buy. Then the guys put some plans on a sheet of paper and decided to think about it later, and suddenly something would change, and they would have the initial installments for their startup. And now, it was time for exams, which were easily passed, because the guys never had any problems with their studies. The only thing ahead was graduation. On this festive day the mother was very worried, her suit was ironed, her dress was ready. And here, her son is standing at the graduation, he is given a certificate. Now the school principal says farewell words that they are releasing the guys into free sailing. Almost just before the graduation John turned 18 years old, so it was not far off to receive a summons to the military enlistment office, and it came. Now the guy had to pass a medical examination, and then go to serve. At least they would send him somewhere not far away, said his mother, who was upset for the child. Don't worry as if I'm still a kid, John told her. You'll always be little to me, his mother hugged him. Though he didn't like all this tenderness, he didn't push her away. The day came when the boy was sent off to the army. Some acquaintances and friends gathered, and the next day he was on his way to the train station. Sunbright, his mother said to him, he cried. I will, he answered her, smiled and entered the car. John was not worried at all. It was not the first time he met with difficulties. He even wanted to know what would happen next, where he would arrive, who would meet him, how things would go. Everything went well. As the mother wanted, the son was sent not so far from home. When the oath was administered, she just took the bus, four hours, and she was already at the location where John was serving. Yes, at first it was difficult for the boy, he had to get into a new team. Everyone has their own habits, their own opinions. Well, and of course arguments with old servicemen. No one cancelled it. After six months of service everything was normal. John continued to serve. It was time for demobilization. He missed home very much when he went there, even worried. He went to a flower store and bought a bouquet for his mom. Dear hello, a woman hugged him at the entrance. Mom, I'm so tired and missed. I want something homemade, he told her. Sure, right away, she went to the kitchen. That day and the next few went wonderfully. John liked it here. He remembered a lot of things, looking out the window. They used to run with their friends in this yard. Mom, do you know where Harry is now? He asked the woman a week later. How should I know? I'm not following him, she looked at him. Why so aggressive? He didn't understand the woman's mood. Nothing, she went to the kitchen. In fact, the woman had already gone to work for a day and thought that the son does nothing and just sits at home. And yet, the young man followed her into the kitchen. John, you have been just sitting at home for more than a week. Maybe you can get a job somewhere. She looked at him seriously. What are you starting? I'll get a job when I need one, he shook his head. He realized that everything was starting all over again. And when will that time come? She wondered. Mom, don't start. He went back to the room. It was not interesting. The young man didn't want to work in a factory or for some uncle. He had a lot of ideas. He wanted to do his own thing. It was necessary to find Harry, because John was sure that the two of them could do a lot of things together. The next day, the young man got ready. He decided to go to Alexei, and if he couldn't find him, at least ask his parents where he was. Hello, he arrived at his friend's house. Oh, John, hello. Harry's mom hugged him. Where's my best friend? He asked her. He's in the country. He went to help his grandmother, the landlady told him. When will he be home? He asked. I do not even know, and you go to him, you'll rest there, dictated the mother of the address where the grandmother lived. Thank you. John did not mind to see his friend. From here he went straight to the train station. He didn't bother to warn his mother, he's an adult now, he does what he wants. The road took only about an hour, then a few minutes on foot to the right house, and here the guy is already knocking on the window. He saw his friend, who pulled back the curtain, looked, and as if he could not believe that a friend had come to him. Well, what are you looking at? Open up, laughed John. No way, shouted Harry, and disappeared through the window. In just a few seconds the gate swung open, and a guy was coming out of there. Didn't you recognize me? John asked his friend as they hugged. 
How can you recognize me? We haven't seen each other for such a long time. The young man was happy. Will you invite me to the house? John asked. Sure, let's go. Grandma just baked pies. They went into the yard and then into the house. They sat down at the table. The woman poured them tea, put a huge dish with pies in the center. She wished them a pleasant appetite and went behind the curtain into the other room. So how are you, Tony? John took a bite of the pie. Everything is great, waiting for you, plans, a mountain, smiled Harry. Well, I'm here. John spread his arms out. We'll start now, we just need to think about a place to live, I don't want to live with my parents. Great, and I wanted to talk to you about it, John rejoiced, because it is easier to rent a place together than alone. I didn't think I could afford it, Harry exhaled. Nah, it'll be fine, his friend assured him. That was the deal. The friends decided to spend a few days here in the village, and then go to the city and start doing something. I'm so glad we haven't lost touch, John said as they drove back to the city. It's okay, Harry shook his head. He remembered from his childhood what a make-believe and initiator John was. I hope so, the boy agreed with him. John arrived home. He thought his mother was going to jump on him, start asking him where he'd been, why he hadn't warned her, but nothing happened. Did you take a walk? She asked him only when the young man entered the apartment. Yes, he did not say anything, went into the room, took out a sports bag, and began to pack. How far are you going? Mom walked in the same place. Harry and I decided to rent an apartment, he told her. Great, as if even pleased, the woman went back to the kitchen. Okay, bye, he stood in the hallway, thinking that his mom would at least come out to see him. Aha, come on, shouted that from the kitchen. He went to a friend who had to ask an acquaintance who rented the apartment whether he still rents it or has already rented it. Hey, what's up? He asked Harry. It's okay, the apartment is not rented yet, so you can move in right now, John's friend said. Great, he smiled. They took some of Harry's things and drove to where they were supposed to live now. After that, the friends sat down at the table to talk about what they wanted to do now. The boys had come up with a really good idea with discs and audio tapes. They were now calculating what they would need. You know, my uncle has a basement space. I don't think he needs it. We'll have to ask, Harry was saying. If everything works out, we'll have very little cost, John said to his friend. And it did work out for the boys. The uncle gave them this little space in the basement, then bought copying equipment, discs, everything was going to work out. John got an old computer somewhere, said it was cheap. Well, God willing, they opened up and started placing ads wherever they could. On the third day, they got a very large order. Hey, guys, a respectable man came to them. Hello. The guys didn't expect this. They thought they'd get one-off orders, but uh, just like that, all at once. I don't know whether you work well or badly, but I have a very urgent order. The customer looked at the surprise guys. Speak, John was the first to speak. I need to make 5,000 discs in three days, said the one. What, a few thousand? John grinned and looked at the equipment they had. I give an advance payment, anything you say, just do it please, the man asked. It was obvious that the matter was urgent. Okay, just let's discuss some things, looked at his friend John, who was still silent. Anything you say was agreed by the customer. After that, John explained to him what and how. Okay, here's the money. He took out a substantial sum from his pocket and put it on the table. Bring the original disc meeting in three days, John said goodbye to him. Are you crazy? Three days? Harry jumped on him. What's the big deal? He didn't understand. It can't be done in a week, especially with our equipment, he almost cried. Calm down, he left us so much money, we'll use it to buy normal equipment, John said knowingly. And if we fail? Harry didn't believe in his own strength. It'll be fine, we'll manage, John promised him. I don't know, his friend doubted. From that moment they began to work actively. They decided to work both day and night. First one would go out, the other would sleep, then they would switch. On the third day they really had everything ready. The customer arrived, he was afraid that it would turn out as with the past performers. He had already given this order to others, but as time passed, when he arrived, he was simply told that they could not do the job. Guys? He walked in without a greeting, and looked at those who worked in this basement. Yes, hello. Come in. Harry was cheerful today because he realized they had done a very difficult job. Did you really make it in time? The man looked at them. 
Of course I promised. John stood up and pointed to the boxes that stood in the corner. First the customer looked at everything, hummed, shook his head, and paid the guys the rest of the money, and plus more for speed. Thanks bye, we'll definitely come to you again, he winked at the guys and called the workers to take the boxes away. Wow, Harry looked at the money. There was enough here to cover several months of rent, with a decent chunk left over. So, let's get on with it, John held out his hand. Sure, laughed his friend and partner. Today the guys decided to relax a bit, go to a cafe to celebrate the completion of a successful deal. Beer? Asked the bartender when they came in. Thank you. The guys nodded and went to a table. Both of them were in high spirits. They sat and discussed their future plans. Toward evening more people started coming to the cafe, and soon there was not a single free seat left. At that moment two girls entered the hall they looked around. Since there were no seats, they came to the bar. Wait, John stopped Harry, he looked at the girls. What did you think of? Now, he got up from the table and went to the bar. There he talked to the girls about something. They laughed, and then he and the guy came back to their table. Hi, they looked at Harry. One took a seat next to John, the other with Harry. Saw there wasn't a seat available for them, so offered to join us, the guy explained to his friend. Understandably, before this Harry couldn't understand how it was that they had gotten acquainted so quickly. I'm Veronica, and this is my girlfriend Lucy, one of the girls said. Nice to meet you, you already know me, and this is my friend Harry, John introduced him. Well, maybe we'll order something too. The girls looked at each other. Of course, especially since it's a holiday, the friends told them about their deal. Wow, you could tell they were interested. After that, they all went for a walk around town together, and when they were saying goodbye, the guys invited the girls to visit. They promised to come. The very next day in the rented apartment of the guys in the kitchen sat four people. Why don't we play cards, couple to couple? Harry asked. Why not? I'm with Lucy, said John and winked at her. I agree, the girl smiled back and blushed. She liked the guy back then in the cafe. They gave out, the game began, guys and girls were laughing, talking about something, it was clear that Lesha Veronica also liked. In the evening the friends separated, each went to see the girl home. When they came home, they shared their impressions. The next day after work, the company gathered again. It went on like this every night. Girls that we are with you all go here and there. Move to us, that Harry after two months of acquaintance. Why, if you don't mind, Lucy looked at John. So Harry and Veronica started living in one room and John and Lucy in the other. At first things were very good, the friends worked together, the girlfriends studied together, and did everything together at home. But when two years of living together passed, the girls began to tell their boyfriends that they had to leave, each wanted something of her own. How long are we going to live like this? We need to start a family, Lucy told John in the room. Do you realize it's going to be hard on our budget? Her boyfriend told her otherwise. And I can't do that, and Veronica doesn't want to either, the girl took offense. The guys went on with their business, but time goes on, everything changes, so what they were doing was no longer in great demand. Now orders came, but they were many times less, respectively, and the income from this was small. One day John received a call from a friend who lived in another city. It was not far away, and was many times smaller than the one where the guys lived and worked now. Hi, John greeted him. Listen, I decided to call you, because I know you're knowledgeable, Carlos began to tell why he was calling. Well, John didn't understand anything yet. I decided to open a repair shop here, computers, phones, other equipment. You're good at it, right? Said excitedly friend. So, what do you want from me? John started to get a little bit into it. Come, we'll work together. We don't have anything like this yet, and people break everything all the time. There was so much enthusiasm in the young man's voice. I'll have to think about it. John asked for some time. Yes, of course, I'm not rushing you, agreed the friend. After this conversation, the guy thought about it. Yes, it was a great option to make money, but it was necessary to leave here in a small town. He didn't know what to do. Lucy, I need to talk to you, he said to the girl then. Talk, she looked at him. Remember, you said that you need to separate. I want to offer you one option. He told her everything that his friend offered him. What, go to some backwater? She grimaced. There you can rent an apartment cheaper and the income will be decent, he persuaded the girl. I don't know, I don't want to, she almost stomped her feet. Okay, you think about it, 
I'll probably definitely go, he went to Lech to tell him the same thing. His friend didn't support him either, he said that if he wanted to, let him go, he would stay here. John did not realize that, only in his head thoughts that everything will work out, and what difference does it make what city to live in? Two weeks later, he called Carlos, said that he had decided everything, and would soon come to find him an apartment. The friend was happy, agreed, said he was looking forward to it. John, I'm pregnant, Lucy surprised him in the evening. I'm glad, he smiled. What to do now, I wasn't going anywhere, she almost cried. Why did you mention it before, I thought we were together, he sat down in front of her. I don't know, she shrugged. Will you go? He looked her in the eye. Yeah. What to say now, she couldn't accept the thought. Harry regretted having to part with his friend, but he had already made up his mind. They walked their friends to the train station. Well, everyone, goodbye, come visit, John said and shook his friend's hand. The girls also said goodbye. Carlos, has promised, rented them an apartment, so now the couple had already arrived there. They settled in quickly. John and Carlos got to work. Like the friend said, there were tons of people. Everyone had something broken and they were bringing it to their shop. The money was very good. Lucy stayed home. She was getting ready to be a mother. What to do in this town? There's nowhere to go. The girl kept begging. Nothing. Now you'll give birth. Then we'll find something to do. John reassured her. He, as he could, took care of Lucy, bought what she asked, practically did everything himself. When the due date came, the girl went to the hospital. There were no problems, the labor went perfectly. Five days later, the happy father met them at the hospital. Why don't you propose to me? Lucy asked him one night. Why are you so sick? He looked at her with surprise. We have a child. It's time to become a family, she answered. No, I don't want to. I don't want an extra stamp in my passport, he answered her easily. So you don't love me? She folded her arms on her chest and turned away from him. Please don't start. You didn't like all these concerts. Lucy was now home with the baby. John was working. The daughter was already five years old when Lucy started talking about the wedding again. Why are you bothering me with this proposal? Was annoyed with the young man. I want a wedding, she told him. I know. He was getting even more annoyed. Then I'm leaving, she stared expectantly. And what do you expect me to start talking you out of it, or running off to buy a ring? He grinned. They've been fighting a lot lately, mostly Lucy's fault. And now that she'd said she was leaving, John didn't mind. That's it, I'm going to my mom's, and be warned, you won't see the baby. She turned and walked away. Why did you suddenly decide so? Was surprised by the young man, he realized that the girl was trying to hurt him. And what have you done for her? Lucy stopped, realizing that she had hurt him. And you what? John had a right to ask that question. From the moment she was born, he had sat by Angelica's crib almost every night, putting her to sleep. Then, when her teeth started to come in, he rocked her in his arms. Then he took the girl to kindergarten, practiced, taught her to read, count, write. Lucy at the same time not only did not work anywhere, she disappeared all day at the girlfriend's, which she has here or in the beauty salon. That's it, that's my last word. She walked into the bathroom and slammed the door. John went to his daughter, he just wanted to talk to her. Of course, if there was no Angelica, this breakup wouldn't have been so painful, but now. The father walked over to Angelica, beckoned her over, and hugged her. Daddy, what's wrong? Why are you so sad? She asked him. Your mom and I had a fight and now she wants to take you away and take you to your grandmother. Don't worry, sometimes that happens between adults, but you and I will always be in touch. He pulled her even tighter against him. Okay, the girl cried, she felt sorry for her daddy and for her mommy. Already the next day Lucy with her things and daughter left. John was at work at that moment. In the evening, when he returned and found no one, it was very bad on the soul. He went down to the yard, went to the store, got himself a beer. Now he sat in the kitchen, poured himself into a glass of amber liquid drink. There was nothing to be sad about except his daughter. He finished his drink, felt very tired, got up and went to bed. Today Nolan took his brain out, there was no need to go anywhere, to do anything, so he just closed his eyes and fell asleep. The young man began to live alone, it could at first seem difficult, you had to cook something, go to work clean, but soon he got used to it. Now he had a lot of free time. He began to work not only in the workshop, but also at home. Hi, Carlos greeted him at work. How are you? John asked him. 
everything is fine, come to visit tonight, today was Saturday, Carlos and his wife were going to stoke the bathhouse. The guy had long dreamed of a private house, and about six months ago he finished building it. Carlos was most proud of his bathhouse. It turned out to be large, and they gathered there. Of course there was nothing to do at home anyway, and they wanted someone to talk to, John agreed. They had work today, and they decided that they would go to the store from here, get some groceries, and go to Carlos's. What are we drinking? The friend looked at John. Beer, what else do you drink in a bathhouse? He was already putting glass bottles in the basket. Great, he agreed with him. They arrived, while Carlos's wife was preparing something in the house. The young men flooded the bathhouse, brought water and wood. They also decided that they would make a kebab. Well, here come the treats, came Maddie to the bathhouse. Thanks, honey, Carlos put his wife on his lap. Leslie's coming over, the girl said. Great, the owner winked at John. It had been about six months since his breakup with Lucy, but John didn't want to meet or date anyone yet. Uh-huh, was all he answered. Leslie burst in like a hurricane. She started saying things from the doorstep, laughing. Meet my friend John, Carlos told her. Hi, she smiled at him. John didn't like the shabby ones, and the girl wasn't his type. They talked all evening, he even walked her home, but he couldn't say he wanted to keep talking to her. Hi, he saw a message from Leslie on social media the next day. She's writing, he told Carlos at the time. What's writing and who? Leslie, the young man said emotionlessly. So answer, his friend suggested. I don't want to. John shook his head. Okay, your business. Carlos did not pry into his friend's business. The next day, when John was going to work, he again received the same message as yesterday from the girl. And again, he didn't react to it. How's it going? A friend asked at work. Nothing new, John shrugged. An hour later, Leslie came to their workshop, but Carlos had gone somewhere else. So as much as John didn't want to, he had to approach the girl. Can you look at my phone? She handed him the device. Now he spun it around, pushed some buttons, realized she'd come up with a reason to come over. The sound was just turned down, he handed the phone back to her. Thanks, how much do I owe you? Leslie tried to make conversation. Not at all, realized the guy, he hadn't done anything at all. Why don't you want to talk to me? She asked him directly. Who told you that? He wasn't looking at her, he was minding his own business. I could see she wasn't going to leave. Oh, Leslie, hey, Carlos is back. Hey, come visit tonight, she called them over, addressing Carlos. Okay, what's the party? The young man asked. None, we'll just sit around, he smiled. It's Monday, said John with a wink. So what didn't understand the girl? Let's wait until the weekend then, said Carlos. Okay, she looked at John one more time and went on her way. She came to see you? The guy guessed. Yeah, she did, John said grudgingly. Why don't you like her? She's a nice girl, his friend didn't understand. I don't want to talk about it. John got up and went to the store to buy something to eat. Okay. Carlos didn't bother him. Leslie kept up. She texted John every day to say hello. They would meet when they went to Carlos' house to visit, but so far John hadn't paid any attention to her. One day the girl went to the store and when she was walking back she saw John, she shouted. Hey, he came up to her. Hi, help me carry the bag, she asked him. Come on, he agreed out of politeness. When they reached the girl's house, she thanked the guy. Maybe you'll come to visit, she asked him. No, was the unequivocal answer. Come on, let's talk, drink tea. What, you're going to run away from me, she called him. Well, he himself at that moment does not know how he agreed and why he went. Leslie inside the soul rejoiced, now he will definitely not go anywhere. Today they had tea and talked. Tomorrow come after work, I'll feed you dinner, she invited him when she went out to see him off. We'll see, he put on his sneakers, said goodbye and left. At work in the morning he didn't tell Carlos anything and in the evening he went home. Are you coming over? Leslie texted him. I'm sorry, but I can't make it tonight, John answered her. I tried so hard I cooked, it turns out for nothing. Even in the message it was obvious that she was offended. Okay, I'll be there soon. John thought to himself that besides having a good meal, you would also spend the evening with an interesting person. Yesterday when they talked, he realized that Leslie was a smart girl, knew a lot of things, and he liked that. Once again they were sitting in the girl's kitchen, talking. Would you like some wine? She asked him. No beer? He asked in response. 
Let me see, she opened the refrigerator. No, only champagne and wine, she looked at the young man. Okay, let's have wine, he agreed. We can go to the store, Leslie suggested. Will you come with me? The guy asked her. Yes, she didn't care what she did, just as long as she was near him. Let's go then. They went to the hallway, put on their shoes and left the apartment. Not half an hour later, the young people sat in the room on the couch in front of the TV and drank beer. Leslie was saying something, they were laughing. At some point their faces were so close that the girl couldn't stand it. Let's kiss, she said to him. John answered nothing, he put his arms around the girl and their lips merged in a kiss. An hour, two hours passed and they kissed and kissed. You're a good kisser, John told her then. You too, she lowered her eyes, stay. No, not tonight, he looked at his watch and started to go home. Okay, will you come tomorrow? She asked, but she wasn't hoping for anything. Yes, he nodded. When John left the apartment, Leslie leaned her back against the door and squeezed her eyes shut. This was the first time a girl had ever pursued a young man on her own, and she had succeeded. The next day she got ready. She cooked dinner, bought beer, wine, who knows what he would want. And the young man showed up, as promised. Hi, Leslie was very shy. She couldn't even approach him. Waiting? He realized by the aromas coming from the kitchen. Yep, she nodded. Tonight went the same way as last night. Why don't you stay over tonight? Leslie asked him. You know, we just started chatting with you. Let's, let's hang out for a while, smiled John. Okay, the girl agreed with him, because she did not want to spoil the already very fragile relationship. The next day John wrote that he couldn't make it. Leslie tried to ask why, but he never explained anything. By the weekend, she texted that she was going to visit Carlos. John said he was invited too. They met again and went home together in the evening. And tonight John didn't even have to be persuaded, he stayed at the girl's place. Of course, they slept in different rooms, and when Leslie woke up in the morning, she did not know whether to approach him or not, what to do. She was shy, as if she was 13 years old. The girl went to the kitchen and made coffee, after that she made breakfast. When everything was ready, she put everything on the coffee table and went to wake up the young man. John, hi. She sat down on the couch where he was sleeping. Good morning, what time is it? He wiped his eyes. It's time for you to go to work. Leslie knew that guys work without days off, so she woke him up. Yeah, I'm getting up now, he said. I made you breakfast. Leslie blushed for some reason. She was embarrassed. Thank you, I'll wash up and go to the kitchen. John got up from the couch. He walked down the hall and Leslie noticed that he was skidding to the right. He washed his face, ate breakfast, told Leslie he would stop by again after work and left. She was happy about it. She couldn't believe that they were really starting a relationship. The girl got everything ready again. She had the day off today, so there was plenty of time. She waited for John and wondered what they would do tonight. Let's go to the movies. She met him on the doorstep of her apartment. Well, if you want, let's have dinner and go, he agreed. They all did so, and after coming from the theater, sat for a while, shared their impressions of the movie, and then went back to bed. For a whole week, John went to Leslie's house, stayed with her, but they still slept in separate rooms. Why don't you sleep with me? The girl asked him one night. I don't know, you don't call me, so I don't lie down, he answered. Well, tonight I do, she said, and her cheeks flushed again. Okay, they were sitting in the kitchen now, and when John got up and walked down the hall, Leslie noticed again that he was skidding to the right. At first, the girl hadn't paid any attention to it and hadn't said anything to him. But about a month after they started living together, John admitted that his right ear had gotten worse the other day. Why don't you go to a doctor? Leslie asked him. You know these doctors, they will say something, they will give you prescriptions, and in fact nothing will help, he waved her away. But at least let them do an examination, understand why this is happening, she told him. No, I definitely will not go to the doctors, the young man replied. All right, suit yourself, she shrugged. But when, after another short time John came home, he told Leslie a terrible story. At work, he wanted to listen to music, but since their workshop was not the only one there, he put on headphones, and when the music started, John could hear with his left ear, but not with his right. The guy thought it was the headphones. He took them off, switched them around, but it turned out they were fine. So he plugged his left ear and asked Carlos to tell him something. 
The young man could see from his lips that his friend was talking, but he couldn't hear what he was saying. John, well, how can it be? I told you that you need to see a doctor. Leslie was afraid for his health. She called a paid clinic, which was in their town, and wanted to make an appointment with an ENT. But when the receptionist listened to her complaints, she said that it was not to an ENT, but to a neurologist. Well, make me an appointment with a neurologist then. She dictated John's first and last name and phone number. When he got home from work in the evening, the girl announced to him that he wasn't going anywhere tomorrow, but was going to a doctor's appointment. She had already made an appointment for him, and he would be expected there. Why did you do that? Are you sure I need it? He said to her then. Sure, she replied, and didn't want to have any more conversations. The next day John went to the doctor. Leslie was waiting for him at home worried. He dialed her number and told her that the neurologist had sent him for an MRI, saying he was 90% sure he had a tumor in his head. Of course, this news really scared the girl. While John got home, she called the clinic and made an appointment for an MRI. Naturally, the doctor's words really scared the young man. He agreed to go through all the procedures. After everything was done and the report was received, John and Leslie sat in her kitchen and both were in shock. The MRI showed that John did indeed have a tumor in his head and surgery was urgently needed. Since the young man's residence registration was in the city where he was born and lived, they went to the hospital there and checked in. The doctor said that the operation could be done under a quota, free of charge. John began to take tests and three days before the operation, went to the hospital. Leslie went home. She took all the phone numbers she needed to find out how the surgery went. All day long, Leslie and John talked on the phone. He would tell her what he was doing, how he was being prepped, what tests he was taking, and everything else. The girl couldn't be home alone, so she went to her close friend's house. And you do not want to go to a fortune teller? Asked her. Why? Leslie didn't understand. Well, just maybe she can tell you something. The friend saw how worried the girl and somehow wanted to help her to calm her down. Do you know anyone? The girl asked her. Yes, I do, nodded her head. They arrived at the woman's house. She asked for a picture and started talking. Leslie listened to her and realized it was all true. But at some point, the woman looked up at her and said that John was going to die during the operation. This the girl couldn't accept. She snatched the picture from her and just walked out of the apartment, ran home. Her girlfriend saw all this followed her, but Leslie didn't want to see anyone right now. She needed to be alone. The day of the surgery, she was on pins and needles. She wouldn't let her phone out of her hands. She paced from corner to corner. She didn't know what was going on. And when eight hours passed, she knew that the operation should have been over by that time. She started calling all the phones. But some of them were busy. Some of them didn't pick up. One number was constantly ringing off the hook. Leslie could not find a place and realized that now it was too late. She could not go there. All night, Leslie didn't sleep. Then in the morning, when it was very early, her phone rang. She saw that it was the number of the surgeon who had done John's operation. Hello, she answered. Hello, Leslie, he said to her. Yes, she wished he'd say something sooner. Please come over, I need to talk to you, he replied. Tell me, what's wrong with John? That was the only question she cared about at that moment. Please come, I'll tell you everything. He sounded as if he was pitying her or something. Can you at least tell me what condition he's in? She was already sobbing. I don't have time, I'll tell you everything, he hung up. Leslie started looking at the bus schedule. She was packing very fast, she had two hours to go. On the bus she looked out the window and was afraid of only one thing, that now she was not following the living person. The words of the fortune teller came to mind that he should die on the operating table and everything coincided. The girl arrived at the hospital. She went in to see the surgeon. He was sitting at the table and he wouldn't look at her. So we told him before the surgery that there might be a facial nerve injury. And it was. And also, he stopped talking. Leslie struggled to stand by the table. She knew she was going to pass out. Doctor, don't be so quiet. She couldn't stand it. During the eight hour operation on the fifth hour, he had a stroke. We had to do a second operation. His heart stopped. Now the condition has stabilized, but your young man is paralyzed on the right side, said the surgeon. Where is he? Can I go to him? What condition is he in? Leslie began to thrash around and realized at some point that everything right now, and then she did not remember anything. She woke up to the smell of ammonia. The doctor was sitting on the floor with her head in his lap. 
Don't worry, he's in stable condition. He's in intensive care now, the doctor said. Can I see him? Leslie said quietly. Of course, the nurse will take you now, the man said calmly. As they walked up to the fourth floor, Leslie thought that maybe John would be uncomfortable for her to see him like this, and he wouldn't want her to look or anything. Her legs were shaking, her whole body tense. She was put on booties, a cap, gloves, a robe, and when they got her in to see him, tears just rolled out of her eyes by themselves. Talk to him, he can hear you, the nurse told her. And Leslie took his hand, and she couldn't get a single word out of her mouth because she realized that if she did, she would just start sobbing. John was lying on the bed. He was hooked up to a ventilator, and there were small tubes sticking out of his arms and everywhere else. After standing there for a while, she realized she couldn't stay here any longer, so she walked out. And then in the hallway she fainted again. Don't worry so much, the nurse told her. Okay, on cotton legs, the girl walked out of the hospital. One thing was good, he was alive, and Leslie knew for sure that he would live on. Now every day she arrived at the hospital in the morning and left in the evening. At first, while John was in ICU, Leslie didn't do anything, just sometimes they let her in there. She would talk to the man she loved. And then when John was moved to the ICU, Leslie would visit him. She helped him get out of bed, walk down the hallways. After he was disconnected from artificial ventilation, a tube was inserted into his throat. Through it he breathed for the first time. It was hard. But the girl loved him so much that all the heaviness faded into the background. John couldn't walk, couldn't move his arm, couldn't talk. Because after they took the tube out of his neck, all the air went out through that hole, you had to cover it with your hand to say anything. He was mostly whispering, but when he tried to say something, it was like Darth Vader from Star Wars. Also, his right eye wouldn't close because his facial nerve was hit. When a month had passed, he was discharged home. Leslie came to the hospital. She took her favorite person out of there. He was in a diaper, couldn't move on his own feet, his arm didn't move at all, his eyes saw but was constantly dry and didn't blink. The girl brought him home. She knew that soon she would have to go to rehab. She dropped everything and was only by his side. John, you and I will be going to rehab soon, she told him. The girl did everything the hospital told her to do. They took pills, gave her shots. They took a cab to the rehab center but it didn't take them further than the barrier, and Leslie had to carry the young man almost on her own. She carried him. They were assigned a ward where they were to live together. Every day John was taken to different treatments, he was really getting better, and when they were discharged after two weeks, Leslie took all the doctor's recommendations. She was given a lot of methodical literature that described different types of massage, facial articulations, and other procedures. She wasn't going to stop with what she had accomplished now, when they got home, they practiced daily with John. They recited different proverbs and said letters to develop the speech apparatus. Afterward, ideally they would walk on a bench, but since Leslie didn't have a bench at home, she would lay out a ribbon on the floor and John would walk on that ribbon. The girl would take him everywhere. Back at the rehab center, the doctor who worked with John advised Leslie to get disability. She found out everything, collected all the documents, took the young man, and they were given a group. Now, although John did not work, but some money fell on his card every month. In the summer she left her job and got a job in a health center, which was located in a pine forest, and took John there with her. The fresh air and exercises on it had a favorable effect on the young man's condition. So a year passed. By this time John was walking on his own. They had almost completely developed his arm. If before it was hanging like a whip, now he could move it, but there were still problems with the hand. John was also starting to speak, only his eye was having problems. Good morning, my love, how are you feeling? Leslie asked him every morning. Good morning, fine, he hugged her then. When they arrived from the rehab center, John turned to her, and as best he could, told her he loved her. Those were the most important words she wanted to hear from a young man. Now that he had everything more or less settled, they were sitting in the kitchen, talking about something, and suddenly John took Leslie's hand. Would you marry me? He asked her. Of course, she answered, without hesitation. Then, you'll be the first person I say those words to, he smiled. Leslie was happy. She just didn't know how to put it into words. Mom, I'm marrying John. The girl called her that same night. Why do you need that invalid? Her mother told her. You don't understand anything. 
I love him more than anything else in the world. I don't need anyone else, only him, she said. Leslie, think a hundred times before you marry him. Her mother warned her. What is there to think about? I have long been ready for it. No one listened to the girl. Many friends and friends condemned her that she threw all her strength to restore the young man, said that he was not suitable for her and everything else, but she did not listen to anyone. And when they decided to make a wedding, they just applied, and on the appointed day came, signed, congratulated each other, and the two of them went to celebrate it all. I love you so much, Leslie clung to John. She was ready to be always near him and never go anywhere. And you are the love of my life, he told her. They were happy until Leslie got pregnant. When she told John about it, he was overjoyed to hear the news. While she was working, it was still all right, but when she went on maternity leave and there was almost no income at all, the family began a little scandal. John's pension wasn't enough for anything, and there was a lot to do. You're not going to do anything? The girl asked her husband. What do you want me to do? He asked in reply. I don't know you're a man. Think of something. She was almost crying. You see, I can't. You was lying on the couch. Can I? I have a belly on my forehead, and I have to do something somewhere. Earn money, cried the girl. After Leslie gave birth, it was decided that she would go to work, and John would stay home with the baby. How can you trust him with a small child? Her mother reprimanded her. Mom, he is a father. He understands everything and knows what to do, especially since he already had a little daughter, the girl told the woman. I don't know if something happens and blame yourself, you can't fix anything, she told her. That's enough mom, I have my own hand on my shoulders. Recently Leslie became very irritable. Not only was she hormonal, but she had to run home every two hours to feed the baby. Work was taking longer than usual. John didn't just sit at home either. When she was still little, after Leslie fed her, she would just go to bed. Now that she was five months old, she needed to be held all the time. The little girl was learning about the world. Why aren't the dishes done at home again? Leslie came home from work irritated. I'm with the baby all day, what dishes? John told her. And I'm at work all day, I'm tired. I'm doing everything so that there's some income in the house. Leslie yelled at him. It was clear to both of them that both he and she were tired, but they could not bring it to each other. Soon after that, when Lika went to kindergarten, John took her out in the morning and brought her back in the evening. Yes, he was making Leslie's life easier, but she wasn't idle either. Sometimes she worked Monday through Friday, work weekends so she could get double pay. And that meant a bigger paycheck. What are you doing on your phone again? She'd said to John. What? I can't even use my phone anymore? He looked at her. I do not know I cannot. I am tired of this life. Nerves on the limit. Answered Leslie. She would go to the bathroom, close herself there, sit there, sometimes crying. She really didn't know what to do. Soon, John figured out how they could make money from home via the internet. They started to make it all a reality. I'm off to work, Leslie said in the morning. John was taking his daughter to daycare. Leslie was going to work and now, in parallel, she was doing what John had invented in working. Money began to appear in the family, along with it expensive appliances, computer, TV, laptop, and everything else. The family could afford more now, and Leslie seemed to settle down. But there was more and more work, more and more. And now it wasn't enough that she was working hard during the day and moonlighting, but there were still things to do at night. I can't take it anymore, I'm going to go crazy. She lay next to her husband, and he didn't seem to have any problems at all. He slept peacefully at night, he could also take a nap during the day. Once Leslie received a call from the employment center and said that one of the organizations requires an employee for a quota place, of course, she grasped at this information like a straw. Once again, she gathered all the paperwork, came home. John, I found you a job. Here are the documents. Go, get settled. She gave him a halyard with papers. Yes, perhaps this girl stressed her husband, but she did not know how to do otherwise. All people live like this. They pay cents there, he told her. So what? But the seniority goes. They had been together for several years and Leslie did not understand why everything had changed so much. Why do I need seniority? John didn't understand. All people work. Why do you think that you are special? The girl didn't understand it either. Now that her daughter had grown up, she needed to work with her. John did something, but at the weekend it was necessary to take Lika to a singing class and also wanted to entertain her somehow. 
Leslie was torn. She cooked at home, then went out with her daughter, and then she had to go to work. I can't, she came home and lay on the couch. Get some rest, John said calmly. Where are we going to eat? She smirked. One can live without frills, he was sure of his words. Lately Leslie realized that they had grown distant from each other. She dialed her friend's number. Hi, she told her. Come visit, her friend called her after the greeting. I will, she packed up, dressed Lika, and they left the house together. While visiting, the girl could exhale a little. In the back of her mind she remembered that she had feelings for John, and as strong as before. But housework, work, and everything else had exhausted her so much that she didn't want anything else. Are you through the store? The girlfriend inquired. Sure, put Leslie a bottle of wine on the table. That's good, we'll rest now, the girlfriend said. Here at Betty's Leslie could relax. She did not think about anything. The daughter was busy with her friend's daughter. They were about the same age. And the girls were sitting in the kitchen talking. You look very tired, Alina said. Yes, I know it myself. Leslie realized that if before she always had her nails painted, eyes, hair styled. But now she didn't care about that. Pony tail on her head, unpainted nails on her hands. Go on vacation, Betty suggested. I can't, Leslie shook her head. They could stay up late into the night, then Leslie and her daughter would drive home. John was already asleep, so she undressed, washed her face, and lay down next to him. Where were you last night? He asked me this morning. You know it was at Betty's, she hadn't slept well, she had a headache now. How should I know that? That's what John said. That's it, I don't want to talk anymore, wrinkled Leslie's nose. She finally poured tea into her mug, now trying to take a sip of the scalding beverage. What else don't you want? He sounded kind of cocky. John, please, I'm going to leave now, do the dishes, vacuum, she begged him. What if I don't feel like it? He wasn't acting like he always does. You know, when you needed help, I did everything. Whether I wanted to or not, she would never have told him that, but now, he was straight up pissing her off. And no one asked you to do it, were the most hurtful words John had ever said to his wife. But you didn't say no, not even once. She squinted, because she felt like she was going to cry. You misunderstood, apparently he realized that he had said the wrong thing, and now he was trying to get out of it. I'm going to work, you'll feed Lika when she wakes up, she turned away and pretended to be busy. Are you going to be long? John asked her as he followed Leslie down the hall. I don't know, she shrugged. Good, he wanted to kiss her, but Leslie was already out. She couldn't show anyone her weakness. No, she's strong. She has a baby. There's also her mom to help, and John, who has a hard time too. She wiped her tears, exhaled, and moved on. Leslie got to work. There was a lot to do. Today was a small children's party. The script was ready. What was left was to hide the tasks that were meant for the kids. Leslie did everything. She knew it would be over in three hours. When the kids arrived, Leslie was already in costume. She was smiling, enticing everyone to follow her. It was a lot of fun. The kids were laughing. They were running, playing, dancing. At the very end, Leslie made a show for the kids, after which everyone began to disperse, and the host cleaned up all that was left after the holiday. That's all, and now home... She looked around the hall and went to change. She went up to her office, changed, and was ready to go out. Bye, she said goodbye to the watchman who had just come in. Tired, Victor asked. Yeah, but it's okay, smiled Leslie. Okay, bye, have a safe trip, he watched and smiled. Thanks, it was nice to know that she was respected by a lot of people here. She walked outside, walked down the porch, went to the gate. Excuse me, she heard from the parking lot. Yeah, she turned, saw a very handsome man heading her way. She'd seen him at the party today, picking up one of the kids. I'm sorry to do this, but I didn't know how else to meet you, he told her. Why would she want to meet me? She didn't understand anything. She liked him, he didn't hide it. Well, maybe you can give me a ride home. Leslie looked at the car from which the stranger had gotten out a few minutes ago. I didn't really want to take public transportation. Sure, I'd love to. He took the bags from her hands and led her to the car. Barry, he got behind the wheel. Leslie, she looked at him. Lovely name, just like you, he tried to compliment her. All right, let's get going already, she sighed. Maybe we could stop for a meal on the way. You're tired from work, Barry suggested. Good, Leslie didn't know why she had agreed, because her husband and daughter were waiting for her at home. 
Wow, and I thought you would refuse me. Barry was surprised and smiled. And I agree, said Barry, laughing. It's good. They stopped near a small restaurant went in. Barry ordered something, but Leslie could not decide for a long time. She hadn't eaten anything since the morning, so now she wanted everything. Finally, she made an order. Now they both waited for it to arrive silent. How about some wine? Barry suggested it. You're driving, aren't you? She was surprised. I'm doing it for you to relax, he explained. I could use a glass, Leslie agreed. Barry signaled to the waiter, who came over and took the order. I'm so uncomfortable sitting here with you, Leslie said, and for some reason she felt ashamed of herself. Why? He didn't understand. My husband and child are waiting for me at home, and here I am, sitting with another man, drinking wine, she smiled. And what's wrong with that? I just came to have a good time with a good friend, of course, it wasn't true at all. Who's at home with you? She asked the question because it had plagued her since she met Barry today. A cat, he shrugged, not knowing what else to say. No wife? She asked in all seriousness. What makes you think I have one? Barry didn't understand. Well, whose child did you pick up today? She admitted to him that she'd seen it. Oh, it's my nephew, my sister's son, he reassured her. At that moment their order was brought to them, they began to eat. Either Leslie hadn't eaten in a long time, or the food here was divine. She chewed and at the same time let out a groan and rolled her eyes. Do you always eat like that? Barry laughed. Oh, I'm sorry, the girl realized she'd done something wrong. No, it's nice to look at, he smiled. You never told me why you came up to me. They knew each other for nothing, but Leslie felt as if she had known him for a long time. What do you mean I didn't say? Because I liked you, I was with the guys when we were there. I noticed you then, he said it and stopped smiling. Why so sad? The girl noticed it. A few sips of wine on an empty stomach did the trick. She was relaxed and opened up. You have a husband, kids, and I wanted us to make something work, he told her. What are you doing? She tensed up. No, it's okay, we'll be friends, he reached out and touched her. After they ate, Barry paid, and they went to the car. Can we go for another drive? He asked Leslie. No, I have to go home, she shook her head. Okay, will you give me your cell phone? He asked and looked at the girl. Yes, she answered calmly. They reached the house where Leslie lived, she got out of the car. All right, Barry promised, and didn't leave until Leslie pulled into the driveway. It was nice to have someone else paying attention to her. The girl walked into the house, it was the same there, no one had done anything. John was lying on the couch again. As usual, she threw things and went to the kitchen, Leka was sitting at the table and drawing something. I'm hungry, she said. Now turned Leslie to the stove, thought to herself that her husband could at least do something. After she got everything done, she fed the baby, bathed her, and put her to bed. She wanted to talk to John, so she came into the room. Were you drinking on the job? He asked, himself not taking his eyes off the phone screen. After stopping by the restaurant to eat, had a drink, she didn't say she wasn't alone. That's it, you sat there alone? John asked. Yes, that was all he needed to know. Okay, good night, he turned on his side. Aren't we going to talk? She was shocked. Not about anything, he kept looking at his phone like that. Okay, she got up and went to her daughter's house. It was frustrating to the point of tears. Why did it have to be like this? She tries, she works her ass off to make everything good at home. But no one appreciates it, Everything is taken for granted. In the morning, Leslie was back at work. Barry had texted her to say good morning. She smiled, replied to him. A correspondence began between them. It seemed to the girl that it distracted her very much from the routine. I'll come over tonight? Barry wrote on Friday. Good, she answered him. Leslie knew her husband would be picking up her daughter from daycare, and she was going to Betty's today anyway, so she could ride for a couple hours. As she waited for him at the gate, Barry pulled up. Leslie got into the car, said hello to him again. Where are we going? The young man asked. I don't know, maybe to the same restaurant where we were the first time? She suggested. Good, he didn't care, as long as it was with her. During the week-long correspondence, they had already learned a lot about each other. Now they had something in common to talk about. How's it going? Barry started with the usual question. Fine, Leslie shrugged. Nothing had changed in her life. I see, you don't want to talk. You looked at the girl. Order me some wine, she asked. 
Just like last time, Barry showed the waiter to come over. He did as the girl asked. They sat, smiling at each other, Barry took Leslie's hand. Don't, she put it away. Why, I can see you're not feeling well, he muttered. So what, she didn't understand. Shouldn't we drop everything and change for the better, he asked her. No, come on, John. She began to tell him how they met, how they found out about the disease, how she nursed him back to health. Just muttered Teresa, he was serious. It's okay, Leslie said sadly. Yeah, I see they brought their order. Just like last time, it was delicious. Barry was saying something, talking about his work, making the girl laugh. It was nice, with this man she was distracted from everything that had been happening to her lately. Shall we go to my place? asked Leslie Barry. No, she said firmly. Then where to? He didn't want to let her go home. Come on, I'll show you. She got up from the table. Great, he was glad Leslie wasn't going anywhere today. The girl told him where to go, it was on the outskirts of town. When they were there, Barry marveled at how beautiful it was. The highway, the field behind it, and then the horizon, all blending together. Do you see why I brought you here? She asked. Yes. It's beautiful, he agreed with her. They just sat in the car, looking out into the distance. Afterward, Leslie asked for a ride home. Barry turned to her, ran his hand over her cheek, leaned in, wanting to kiss her. No, she turned away. I don't understand why, he looked at the one he liked. I have a husband, I love him, the girl said. I see, sighed the young man. Let's go then, she waited for him to start the engine. You know I can see you're not feeling well, he muttered softly. Barry, don't ruin the relationship we have, Leslie asked him. Okay, I'm sorry, he started the car and they drove off. I'm home, she entered the apartment. No one answered her. Leslie walked over to her daughter, stroked her head, kissed her, asked if she was hungry. After Lika said she and daddy had eaten, Leslie headed into the other room, where John was lying on the couch again. Today he was with a tablet. Are you okay? She asked. What do you mean he didn't understand? I'm at work all day and you never went anywhere, the girl said. She looked at her husband and realized that there was a problem in their family and it had to be solved somehow. She didn't want to leave him because she loved him. What do you want from me? He asked. To talk, Leslie sat down beside him, leaned in, kissed him. Have you been drinking again? He could smell it on her. Look, if things were good in my family, would I be doing this? I remembered how good things used to be. Are you trying to accuse me of something now? He turned around. No, she shook her head. Then what? John looked at her with one eye. Let's go to a psychologist, Leslie suggested. I don't mean any psychologist, he sounded sure of that. I do and I was ashamed to admit it, but it was true. It was obvious that John didn't want to talk to Leslie anymore. She went to the kitchen, she wanted to cry, but she knew it wouldn't help her. The next day, when the girl came to work, she saw that there were flowers on the table. Who brought them? Leslie was surprised. I do not know, the watchman brought, said that for you answered colleagues. Okay. Thanks, it's nice. She took a picture and sent it to Barry. Did you do this? She signed it. Why? I wanted to make you feel good in the morning, to lift your spirits, he replied. Thank you, she sent it to him now. In the evening he waited for her again. Why are you doing this? Apart from being friends, you and I can't be anything else, she said confidently. Let's go, I'll just drive you home, he opened the doors for her. Leslie got in, they drove. They didn't talk about anything today. When they got to the driveway, she wanted to get out, but Barry took her hand. Tell me, do you really love him or do you just feel sorry for him? He asked the girl. What kind of questions are these? She put her foot out into the street and her hand Barry held it that way. Answer, he waited. If you don't let go now, we won't socialize at all anymore, she told him. Sorry, he let her go and Leslie walked quickly toward the driveway. At home, everything was the same. For a long time nothing had changed at all. Almost every day Barry came over to Leslie's house, but she wouldn't let him do anything, just socialize. He was relaxed, fun, and interesting. Are you working again today? John came up to Barry on his day off. Probably haven't called yet, Leslie mumbled. John came up to her, hugged her. Leslie immediately remembered everything, how tender he was, and what they had before. Why don't we go out? She suggested it. No. I don't feel like going out, he said in her ear. Why is it like this? Leslie asked. 
I don't know, he shrugged. Let's go on vacation. I'll buy the vouchers. We'll have a vacation together, without Lika, Leslie suggested again. Good, even rejoiced John. Then tomorrow I'll look for a vacation, smiled Leslie, turned and kissed John. Tonight they slept together. Everything was fine. The next day he wished Barry good morning and made coffee. Thankfully in the last six months, she was home for the second day in a row. No one had called her in to work. Leslie sat down at the computer to look up travel vouchers. She sat for a long time, choosing. Sometimes John would come up to her, asking questions, offering advice. When Leslie had done everything, all that was left was to pay. She did that too. The flight was a week away. Now she had to talk to the director about needing a short vacation. So, are you ready? She had packed all her bags. She had taken Lika to her mom's. And now she was ready for anything. She hadn't talked to Barry in a week. He'd been flooding her with messages and calls, but Leslie didn't want to pay any attention to it. Sure enough, John was smiling. The next day, the couple hailed a cab and they drove to the airport. In the car, John held Leslie's hand. Afterward, they took their bags and went to check in. Then a few hours on the airplane, and then they were almost near the sea. Their hotel stood near the sea itself. Now they were heading there. When they got into the room, they were amazed at the view from the window. On the first day they went to the beach, but only to scout the situation. Everything was gorgeous, at first John went everywhere with Leslie. But a couple of days passed, as he again laid down with his tablet, and did not want to go anywhere. Are you really not interested in anything? Leslie asked him. Why go out every day? He didn't understand. We could lie at home. They started arguing again. So what? He didn't understand what her complaint was. Nothing, Leslie turned around and walked away. Where are you going? John asked after her. To the sea, I want to be alone, she walked and cried again. Why must she always be alone? He's never there. Always, no matter what in life were not difficulties or joys, with all this girl was left alone. It was now that Leslie decided to text Barry. Hi, she typed. And I thought you wouldn't write again, he replied after a second. Sorry, she didn't know what else to write. I understand. When are you coming back? He asked. How do you know? She wondered. I was at your work. They said you were on vacation, Barry admitted. I see, in a week, she didn't keep anything from him. Can I hope to see you again? Barry asked her. Probably yes. She wasn't sure, but for some reason she wanted to. Well then, I look forward to your return, he wrote. Great, bye. She wrote and looked out at the blue of the sea. It was so beautiful and Leslie relaxed a little. Now she wished she had brought Lika with her. Now she would be running around here. She would have loved it for sure. The rest of the week went well, but that was it for Leslie. John went out to the sea a couple more times and spent the rest of the time in the hotel, on the bed. Tomorrow we fly home. Let's spend at least tonight together, Leslie asked her husband. And we are not together. It became strange to him. As if together, but as if not, she approached him. Nastia, understand, I quickly get tired and just nowhere do not want to go, he took her hand. I understand, but the sea air is useful, especially for you, she leaned over and kissed him. It gets in here in the room, John pointed to the open window. Yes, but that's not it at all, she looked where he was pointing. Leslie managed to get her husband to go to the restaurant with her. He sat and ate, they didn't talk about anything. Beautiful music started playing. Let's go dancing, Leslie asked him. No, it's not my thing, he refused. But Leslie realized she felt like crying again. They went home. They had to fly home the next day. Leslie bought some souvenirs. The bags were packed. They could leave. They were silent on the airplane in the car. Finally, we were home. I'm going to Betty's. I'll pick up Lika on the way. Leslie wanted to see her friend to cry. But as soon as she left the house, she saw Barry's car and came over. What are you doing here? She asked him. You don't know, he looked at her and smiled. I see she looked up at her windows. And what's clear to you? He took her hand and pulled her to him. Wait, she walked around the car and sat in the front seat. And what next? He was already curious. Let's go, she asked. Barry complied with her request and they drove off again to the place where they had once spent time and it was so beautiful. Do you mind? He turned to the girl. No, even pro, she smiled. Why does she feel so good with this man? 
He's socializing, willing to do a lot for her. And the husband she loves so much is willing to do nothing. Tell me about it, they stopped. Barry turned to Burr. What's to tell? They've been on vacation for days and he hasn't even left the room, Leslie said indignantly. Let's go to my place? He touched her chin. Let's go, she nodded. No way, he quickly started the car. They drove off. On the way, Leslie called her mom, saying they were having problems with John. She'd be there tomorrow to pick up Lika. And I warned you, her mom reminded her, about what she said before the wedding. Oh, don't start, please, asked her daughter. Okay. We'll wait for tomorrow, said the woman and hung up the phone. Is everything okay? Asked the one who was sitting behind the wheel. Yep, nodded Leslie. She'd set her mind to go with him today and try to build a very different relationship, but she didn't know if she could do it or not. They arrived, went up to Barry's apartment, and he immediately set up a table, got some wine, some appetizers, and took a beer from the fridge. What, were you getting ready? It made the girl laugh. No. But just in case it was always there, he smiled. He opened the wine, filled his glass, then got himself a beer. Come on, thank you for your support. She made a toast. Okay, and thank you for everything. He took a small sip. For what? She didn't understand. For what you are, he reached for her, wanting to kiss her. Leslie was ready for it. She even closed her eyes, but then she pictured John. Remembered how much she loved him and what they had. No, I can't. She pulled away and opened her eyes. Here we go, Barry sighed. I'm sorry, I can't, she stood up. Where are you going? The landlord didn't understand. I need to go home, she went into the hallway. Leslie, wait, he followed her. No, I'm sorry for all that I'm getting on your nerves, you're hoping for something. But I love my husband and I have to go home, she said. Okay, you didn't try to talk her out of it. Leslie left his apartment, she reluctantly went home, she knew that nothing new was waiting for her there. But she went anyway. She wanted to talk to her husband. Maybe now he would hear her and understand. What if she told him about Janya? Told him that a young man was hitting on her? I wonder what his reaction would be, she asked herself. Though Barry offered to drive her, she didn't agree. She needed to walk, to think. At that moment her mom texted, telling her to go to them if things were bad. Maybe she should go to her mom's, she paused. But after that, she shook her head and went home even though she didn't really want to. I'm home, she opened the door and walked in. But when she turned around, froze with surprise. There was nothing in the apartment. She noticed that right from the hallway, TV, computer, laptop, all the appliances from the kitchen, anything of any value was missing. The first thing Leslie thought was that the apartment had been burglarized. She rushed to the wall, opened the closet where there was a jewelry box and money. She couldn't believe her eyes, the rings, earrings and bracelets were still there, but the money was missing. Clearly, if it was thieves they would have taken everything, but here. She walked further, saw that John's clothes were missing from the closet, went to the nightstand, the papers were also missing. She sat down on the couch and cried. Why did he do this to me? I never spared anything for him, I loved him, and he, she sobbed brokenly. Leslie dialed John's number, he blacklisted her. She tried to write to him in the social network, he blocked her there too. After that, the girl called her mom, told everything. She went to the kitchen, opened the drawer where the first aid kit was, took out a sedative, drank it. She noticed a piece of paper on the table, walked over, smirked. It was a letter from him. He wrote that he loved her and thanked her for everything she'd done for him. But he realized he needed to leave. It also talked about blocking her so she wouldn't push pity and return it. Leslie grinned. There was a knock on the door. She went to open it. Barry was standing on the doorstep. What are you doing here? She said. I realized if I don't catch up with you now, I'll lose you forever, he told her. Barry, he's gone. She showed him the empty apartment. The bastard, his fists clenched. Enough, she let her guest into the kitchen. They sat down at the table. Leslie poured tea, showed Barry what she wrote her last letter to the one she loved so much and was ready to die herself, but to save him. I see you read it. Pack up. She didn't understand, she looked at him with red eyes. Let's go to my place, you wasn't asking now, you was affirming. I'll even, she didn't finish, he walked up to her and started kissing her. It was so unexpected that Leslie responded. There will be no objections, he took the bag and started putting some of her things in it. Let me do it myself, she took it from him. Great, Barry said. 
and Lika. Leslie stopped in the hallway. Like you wanted, we'll pick her up tomorrow. He put his arm around her shoulders and led her outside. You're on foot. The girl was surprised. She had never seen him without a car. I had a beer, he reminded her. They came to his house. He poured her wine, sat her in an armchair. Listen, you need to calm down. And even if things don't work out, you can stay at my place for now. We'll pick up your daughter tomorrow. I'll help you with everything. Now he was acting like Leslie and John. Thank you for everything, she snuggled up to him. The sedative, wine and tears quickly made Leslie drowsy. Barry carried her to the bed, covered her with a blanket, and closed the doors behind him. He liked her very much, and he would do anything to make her reciprocate. The next day, Leslie didn't go to work. She says she had a family emergency. She herself went to her mom's house, who worked two and two, and just today she had the day off. Hi, she came into the apartment. Hello, her mom hugged her, and Leslie started crying again. No need to shed tears, so it had to be, in fact. The woman was angry, but she could not say anything bad now. She knew that the daughter would still be on his side. They went to the kitchen. There they sat and talked for a long time. Do you know who helped me? Leslie asked her mom. No, of course, she looked at her surprise. I have an acquaintance whom I think you'll meet today, the girl muttered. Just an acquaintance, or her mother looked at her enigmatically. Mom, just for now, smiled Leslie. It makes me happy to see you smiling, they hugged again. In the evening Leslie went to daycare, picked up her daughter, and together they drove to Barry's. And then they went with him to his mom's to keep her informed. Hello, Barry entered the apartment and gave the woman flowers. Come in, she invited him in. Once everyone was introduced and seated at the table, a casual conversation began. You know how much I love your daughter, and if it were up to me, I would have proposed to her already today, Barry said. Well, nothing to worry about. Now they will divorce. And go ahead. Green light, smiled the woman. Leslie was putting Lika to bed at that moment. She came back, only heard the end of the conversation. Without me, I was married, she smiled. Come in, daughter, and I advise you not to ignore Barry. You can immediately see that this is a good man, began to say mom. Calm down, my husband left me yesterday, and you're already giving me a new one, Leslie said sternly. Why are you slipping your new husband? Barry was offended. Well, do not quarrel. Time will put everything in its place, said the woman wisdom. That's right. Today Barry said goodbye to Leslie and went home. The girl went out to work again. She couldn't think about John. As soon as she started to do so, tears came to her eyes. Why do you need him? Forget it. Go and file for divorce, Halik said. Barry came over every night. He'd meet the girl gave flowers until he calmed down and made no attempts to get closer. A month passed, Leslie waited for him to call or write, but John never showed up. Under the pressure of her mother and friends, she filed for divorce. In a month, she was to become a free woman. Laika suffered the most. She, just like her mom, cried when she found out her dad had left. It would be okay, Leslie decided she wouldn't cry anymore. I know, her daughter looked at her and hugged her. They stayed at Leslie's mother's house for a while longer, but it couldn't last all the time. And at some point, the girl asked Jania to take her home. He did everything that the most beloved woman asked of him. A month later, her mother called, asked how things were going, and then said that she was waiting for her in the evening to visit. So let's do it on the weekend, was Leslie surprised, because today was Wednesday. No, it is necessary that you come exactly today, insisted the mother. Okay, did not understand the girl, what was the urgency? She picked up Lika from kindergarten and went to her mother's house. When she arrived, everything was as usual. Ma, what's the emergency? She wanted to know. Come in, she called her into the room. Wow, Leslie went there and saw a gorgeous table, which was set and stood in the middle. Why are you surprised? Sat down on a chair, woman. I don't know, what kind of holiday? She pointed with her eyes at everything that was here. You'll soon find out at that moment there was a knock on the door. The mother went to open it, and Barry stood on the doorstep. He was wearing a suit and carrying flowers. Leslie immediately understood everything. She smiled. Barry walked over to her, looked at the woman and the girl who were standing there. Leslie, will you be my wife? He handed her a box. I don't even know, she looked at everyone. Mommy, say yes, jerked her daughter by her finger. Can I think about it? She looked at the man across the table. You give me an answer first, then think as much as you want, 
muttered Barry. Okay, I agree. She blushed and took the flowers in the box. You made the right choice, Barry kissed her. Well, now to the table. The mother was happy with the way things had turned out. They sat and talked. And then Barry asked her to come with him. Lika, are you staying here? Her grandmother asked her. Yes, she nodded and looked at her mother. Don't you think it's going too fast? Leslie asked wife when they were already outside. It's okay, I love you very much, he pulled her close to him. I can't say the same to you yet, the girl admitted. I don't have to yet, he smiled. Thank you, she snuggled up to him. Today, when they arrived at the man's apartment, he was finally able to kiss her. Leslie was smiling, and Barry could see that he could make her happy. I have to work tomorrow, she told him, looking over at her watch. Stop thinking about it, he kissed her again. And then the wedding preparations began. Barry didn't want just a signing, he wanted a wedding, and the most beautiful one for his beloved. Barry wanted her to be a princess. What are you thinking about? Leslie saw that he was often pensive. About you? He was telling the truth. What were you thinking? She wondered. Nothing. He winked at his future Barry. All right, always secrets. She was really happy, and now she didn't think about the one who had betrayed her. The wedding day arrived. Leslie was wearing a beautiful dress. The groom was standing next to her. He was also very nice. Guests, relatives, and friends congratulated. Everyone wished only happiness and great love. Daughter, do not doubt him. You will be a great husband and father. Mommy, I'm happy for you, Lika told her. Thank you, family, smiled and hugged them Leslie. And you just dare to be unhappy and stop remembering the past, the woman wagged her finger. Good, she nodded. They arrived home in the evening. Lika wasn't with them today either. Are you really so perfect? The wife looked at her husband. Naturally, what isn't? Waiting this long to start messing with you now, he laughed. Come on, she pounded him in the chest with her fist. You have no idea how much I love you. He pulled her against him for the second time that evening. And I you, she said softly. What, what did you say? Say it again, he looked at her. I love you, she didn't look at him. God, Leslie, we're going to be the happiest couple. Barry began to kiss her. Thank you. She closed her eyes and it seemed like she really was the happiest person on earth right now. Can you promise me something? He asked his wife. Of course, she looked up at him. Stop being strong. I'll do anything for you. He pushed her a little away from him and was now looking straight into her eyes. I don't know how to do that. She remembered what she had done before. But you'll learn, promise? He wouldn't let go of her hand. I'll try, she nodded, but didn't take her eyes off him. Okay, I believe you. You're my love forever, and I swear to you that you'll be like a stone wall behind me. He drew her to him again. Thank you, the girl said with just one lip. She believed that maybe happiness was smiling on her now. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story, and see you on the channel.